Hello everyone, I'm Salim Barahme, the director of PIPD, and I want to welcome you to Dardashe, a series where we talk at length with amazing and inspiring Palestinians about their lives and the work they do. Today, we're lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, a Palestinian leader, a troublemaker, a grandma, and she happens to be also a member of the executive committee of the PLO, which is the highest body in Palestinian politics. Uh, hi, Dr. it's great to have you with us. Hi, Salam. It's good to be with you. Uh, how are you holding up with the, the lockdown, the quarantine? How are you keeping busy these days? Ah, well, work never stops, but the type of work we do has increased, actually, because we have to do it uh, by internet. We have to do it uh, long distance. But in addition, now uh, I, I'm working on uh, plans and programs to keep my grandchildren amused long distance as well. So I'm taking out all these games and toys and paintings and clowning around with the grandkids. So that's another thing that I didn't expect to be doing. That's fantastic. Education and entertainment at the same yes. time. <laughs> we, we are working within civil society and within my office in, in the PLO of um, public diplomacy and policy. Fantastic. So, Doctor, I, I wanted to, to, to take the chance to chat to you about your amazing life and your amazing career. Um, I mean, it's, it's been tremendous and what a journey, uh, still continuing. Um, you're originally from Ramallah, you grew up in Ramallah. So I wanted to ask, start there and, and ask you what it was like uh, when, when you were a child in Ramallah, what were your earliest memories? Um, were you aware of what was going on, you know, with the Nakba in 1948 and, and the aftermath? Yeah, well, I was a, a baby when the Nakba took, took place. So in a sense, I have no living memory myself of the Nakba, although my parents were in Tiberias. And since my father was a medical doctor and he was moving from one city to the other, in 48, they had to leave Tiberias, mm -hmm. went to Amman, from Amman came back to Ramallah. And uh, my earliest childhood memories are from Ramallah. Uh, even though I was born in Nablus, by the way. <laughs> you know that. I didn't know that. I was born in Nablus because my father was a, a medical officer in Nablus. Then he moved to Tiberias. Then the war took place. Then they left Tiberias. So anyway, uh, my we we led a relatively sheltered life in Ramallah because I think the horrors of '48 uh, in, in many ways affected my parents, and they really didn't want us to be exposed to wars and danger and and threats and so on. Uh, so as children, we, we had a sheltered life. We knew about what had happened, but not in details. I didn't know, for example, about my father's role in, in 48. I didn't know uh, the details. But uh, gradually, of course, uh, I learned. But the, the most shocking thing I learned was when I went to AUB. Uh, mm. Beirut, the American University of Beirut, and I started volunteering in the uh, refugee camps, and I was exposed head on to the horrors uh, and, and the suffering uh, in the refugee camps. And that's what, in a sense, woke me up and told me you've been leading too sheltered a life. It was all abstract. It was all, you know, um, in the past, let's put it that way. But uh, then it became very real. Is that what led to you becoming politically active at AUB and kind of your formative? Yeah. That years? started it. That, that was my first confrontation with the aftermath of 48, the, the plight of the refugees. Uh, we were relatively privileged and sheltered, as I said, in the Malach, my, my father's town, it's where he was raised and so on. And so we didn't uh, feel the privation there, but I felt what it meant to be um, dispossessed, to be uprooted, to be expelled, and to be entirely vulnerable as refugees in, in Lebanon. So that was a shock of awareness. But then 67 was a turning point, the war in 1967. Mm -hmm. That's when I, I really saw that this became, I wrote about this as it, it's no longer my parents' issue. It's no longer my parents' responsibility. Now it's mine. It's my house <laughs> that is being mm -hmm. shared. It's my city, my town that is being surrounded. It's uh, my country that is being invaded. So the my, the personal possessive became very important. And uh, that's how I, I uh, decided I'd better do something about it. 
course, in, uh, in Beirut at that time, we tried to get back to join the, the struggle, and we couldn't. <laughs> I got on the bus, we reached uh, Syria, we were turned back, <laughs> and uh, then I joined the General Union of Palestine Students, and I ran for elections, and that was the beginning of my political work through the uh, through GAPS, which is, of course, a, a major PLO organization that organizes Palestinian students everywhere. Amazing. And you were you were unable to return for a while because you were caught in, in, in Beirut when 67 yes. happened. I was caught in Beirut. I wasn't allowed to return. And when my father applied for a family reunion, uh, they told him, we will give you a family reunion, but we will have to arrest her. <laughs> when she comes, no choice so, to give your father. Take that risk. I said, never mind. You know, take, uh, get me a family reunion. I want to g uh, go home. He couldn't get me a family reunion for six or seven years. Uh, so I went from Beirut. I didn't have a, a. I wasn't a student. I graduated. I didn't have a work permit. I didn't have a visa to stay. So. Uh, fortunately, I got a scholarship to go to the States and I went to UVA, to the University of Virginia, to do my PhD uh, and uh, called my parents, told them I was in the States. And uh, that's a new phase in my life, another turning point. Yeah. How, how was it as a Palestinian in, in the US during that time? Because I know for a lot of Palestinian students, all over the world, they find it quite difficult, especially in America now in this environment. And I can imagine that the environment maybe wasn't too dissimilar even back then. <laughs> Actually, it was much worse. I mean, sometimes there is a, a degree of safety and ignorance because people didn't know. But mm -hmm. there was also a lot of stereotyping. I mean, I was either told, I, I would say I came from Palestine, they would say Pakistan, of course. And I'd say, no, Palestine. And then there's the whole issue of there's no such thing. It doesn't exist. And then there's the other response, which is, ah, you're a terrorist. Uh, and, and then the, the third response was that you must be a refugee. So I said we were either non-existent or we were dealt with within the Aristotelian dualism of pitiful pity and fear, either pitiful refugees or fearful terrorists. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about this as I felt we were never really approached in our reality, in the fullness of our humanity, our culture, our life, our history. We were stereotyped and labeled and compartmentalized uh, and, and so on. So I, I was faced head on with, with the challenge of having not just to defend who I am and so on, but also to affirm, to intrude on their lack of knowledge, on their ignorance, on their very convenient um, uh, sort of uh, compartmentalization and to, to tell them, you know, and my humanity and my, I'm, I'm just like you, I'm, I'm a human being, but I can do uh, anything you can do in many ways. And that I come from a culture and a history and a people who have been shoved aside, who have been ignored and on the one hand, on the other who've been victimized and who have escaped in many ways the consciousness and the knowledge of the rest of the world except in relation to uh, the creation of the State of Israel, without understanding the victimization of the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a long thing. How do you get people to unlearn what they've learned? How do you challenge people's labels and stereotypes? How do you uh, maintain your strength and your character and become a real troublemaker despite the, the, uh, all the barriers and, and the frames and so on that people have? Uh, and, and what, was, what did you find was your approach to dealing with a lot of this stuff? I'm sure you were you were quite young and it was quite foreign and quite uh, antagonistic, aggressive yes. atmosphere That's to true. be confronted with. <laughs> and also I was a woman, an academic, who wanted to get a PhD in a very esoteric subject. Mm. And I was told women get married and have children. <laughs> I yeah. said, so do men. <laughs> they, they do get married and have yeah, children. I can imagine. So I had many things working against me. Uh, but I, I refused to be intimidated. There was something maybe in my upbringing uh, where my father said, you have to be daring in the pursuit of what is right. In the pursuit of the right. Be daring. Be, be, and, and don't accept other people's limits. He said, we, raised, we were five daughters, five sisters. 
He said, I raised you, and my mother was also a feminist in many ways as an activist. My father was a conscious feminist who wrote about women's rights. So I said, don't, don't accept other limitations, other people's definitions of who you are. Uh, you have to define yourself and your abilities and so on. So I did. I decided to do something that later on Peter Jennings always told me to do, that Palestinians have the added burden of having to be better than others. Mm -hmm because they are always treated with, uh, measured by a different yardstick. And, and so, so I decided the best way to do this is to be an excellent student and to be an activist at the same time and to join with other movements. Remember at that time, you don't remember, it was the heyday of the students' movement. It was the day of mm -hmm. revolution. And so I uh, worked with the um, um, American Friends of Free Palestine uh, we worked with the, the Arab Students Alliance. I worked with the Black Students Alliance as well. I even went and met with the uh, Appalachian mine workers who knew a lot about Palestine. Wow. I would have never have guessed that. There was a left-wing movement in, in the States at that time. Mm -hmm. There was the Virginia Collective, um, and it was a commune. Um, there was the uh, Socialist Workers' Party at, at the UVA then. There were all sorts of movements and somehow I found a niche for Palestine with uh, lots of people in Saudi I was the only Palestinian. I was actually the only foreigner in the English department. But at the wow. same time, <laughs> there were many who worked with me uh, to define the Palestinian struggle, to uh, make it real and, and bring it to the consciousness of uh, people. And uh, the, the left and the new left at that time and the anti-Vietnam War movement and the Mine Workers Union and the Black Students uh, Alliance and so on, they all, uh, in a sense, embraced the Palestinian cause. That's why I always say it's important to work within a collective. It's important to have a solidarity movement and networks and so on and to identify on the basis of values, on the basis of what brings us together uh, I was uh, the only brown, non-black, <laughs> stay in the Black Students Alliance, which was mm -hmm. uh, great. I was an angry member. So uh, in many ways, uh, uh, not being intimidated and affirming who you are and finding allies and doing the best that you can. At first, the American students, you know, were very condescending, patronizing. There weren't many uh, third world uh, people. There weren't people of color and so on. And UVA was elitist, right? And so they were, you know, patronized. It's okay, she's a foreigner, she, she's fine. So when I got permission to proceed to the PhD after one semester and the rest of my group didn't get it, that's when they started taking me serious, <laughs> seriously. That of course, they, you're reckoning with. Yeah, I was a threat academically, not somebody to pat on the back and say, you'll try and you won't make it and you'll go home and so on. Mm -hmm. So then I made a place for myself and I took my job seriously when I got to a teaching uh, post uh, as, as a postgraduate. I made sure that I was an excellent teacher. I made sure that I had good relations with my students and I listened to them. And again, established. And I was young, so they felt I was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, 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 what I tell all my uh, students and my uh, young colleagues always be the best that you can and always mentor others and always empower others mm -hmm. and so being from that time on being a teacher to me meant something more than just the academic setting and yeah. being an activist it I, I recognize a lot of what you say in the sense that as palestinians especially palestinians who go uh, study abroad work abroad we we have to deal with being measured by a different yardstick, but also the constant thread throughout history of dehumanization of who we are as a people and us needing to fight back against that. How long exactly. were you in the war, Doctora? Four years. Four years. Four years, but during those years, when I was asked first, when I got there, what is it that I wanted to do? I said, I wanted to go home. So my, my focus was, how do I get back home? Uh, but I also wanted to get a good education. And as you know, I, had, I have a very pedantic streak in me. I love scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> I love academics and I love teaching and research and writing and so on. Hi there, pardon the interruption. 
If you're enjoying the Dardashe series so far, make sure to like this video and subscribe for more. Also, check out our other work and our campaigns on our Facebook page, Twitter page, and Instagram. We hope to bring you so many more Palestinian voices on Dardashe. Stay tuned, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the interview. And then I went, I got to Beirut, and in Beirut, uh, of course, that was different. I met all my old friends, people I had known, and many of the Palestinian leaders whom I met in 69 before I went to the States, including uh, Abu Ammar, Yasser Arafat, including Abu Jihad, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Abu Iyad, and all the people who, to us, always remain as larger than life figures, the leaders of the revolution. What was the <laughs> meeting them is dangerous. Meeting them was extremely dangerous, of course. What was it like meeting them for the first time as a, as a young Palestinian? I met them first when I was in Beirut, actually. <laughs> so it was a, a reunion when I came back from the States mm -hmm. to Beirut. When I was studying, when I was a young undergrad, I, I, I told some friends of mine in one meeting that when I started working for the cause, I was a young girl in hot pants, <laughs> undergraduate. Now I'm a grandmother in uh, pantsuits. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a long time, but meeting them, I mean, look, I was here, I was a young undergraduate. The first time I ran for a uh, representative role in, the, in GAPS. And to see those, you know, revolutionaries larger than life and so on, to me was astounding. Uh, but at the same time, I was working within uh, groups and organizations of students and so on. So we felt, we really had the confidence, we felt we could change the world. Mm -hmm. I think I told you this sometime, uh, Salem, uh, that our, my generation was lucky in the sense that we felt we had handles on reality. We mm -hmm. felt we could challenge. We felt we had the power to change the world. And, and coming at the, the end of the student revolution uh, all over the world, there was a global movement and we were part of it. Mm. And so we felt all you had to do was, you know, get this handle, get this traction, work with others, change the world. Uh, you can do it. And, yeah. and we had that sense. And that, that is invigorating. Um, unfortunately, the young people today don't have that sense that because they feel trapped. They feel locked in in a situation mm -hmm. not of their own making, whether it's internal, domestic, or whether it is global whether it is the Palestinian system, whether it is Israeli occupation, whether it is the global system, whether it is Trumpism, whether it is racism, whether it's... Everything has come to a head now. And you, you have difficulty defining, defining not just to your enemies, but what are the obstacles that you have to remove? Not just what your objectives are, you know what your objectives are. But how do you begin to dismantle, to disentangle this whole web <laughs> That is holding yeah. the news. I, I, I recognize a lot of what you say. There is this deep frustration, but also this apathy that comes from, I think, a long time being, uh, or not feeling as being as part of uh, something, part of something, something, uh, a political system, a political organization that you can engage with and shape and, and help um, That's change the world. Shame. Yeah. That's a shame. Yeah. I think it begins with the person, with the individual, and then it has to move. Beyond yeah. that, you have to find your collective, you have to find your setting, you have to find your, the people with whom you can work. I always say one person can make a difference, yes. But also, if you want to make a long-term historical change, you have to work together with like-minded people to challenge what exists, to become a troublemaker, to question, <laughs> yeah. and to, to define your own priorities and to define your own setting and where you want to go. Not to, to accept to be excluded or intimidated or defined by others. Can I ask you what, as, as a young Palestinian back then and, and being part of the students' movement, what was the relationship like with the leadership, with the revolutionaries that you looked up to? Was it, was it mm -hmm. easy? I can imagine it wasn't always easy engaging with well, them. At, it had to be secret at first, frankly, mm -hmm. because I was coming home and I knew that uh, you would get arrested, that you went to prison if you knew these people. So I had to deny that I even knew them when I came home. But uh, <clears throat> there was something interesting because I was the only elected member. And when Yasser Arafat came to address the uh, assembly, as we were the, the, 
a plenary meeting and he got up on stage and he talked and I was just fascinated listening to him and seeing how, how immediate, huh? how spontaneous mm -hmm. he was and how personal he was. Then he finished and he came down and then he came straight to me, took me by the hand and asked me to sit next to him. And I said, do you know what that means? If anybody has a picture of me sitting next to you, I won't be able to go home. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But he said, I, I recognize you. I see in you the future. And to me, it was very touching. And mm -hmm. we started a very, very close relationship, even though we didn't see each other often, even though I wasn't allowed to see people, you know, the leadership and so on, until later when we used to go to Tunis and secret and so on. But uh, the fact that there was this man who to us was the cause, you know, the revolutionary, the leader and so on, who noticed one student among, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, and who, who made me sit next to him and said, I recognize you. That's why to me it's important for young people to have leadership, to have patrons, to have people who recognize them and recognize mm -hmm. what's in them to bring out the best. And that to me has always been important, an important defining moment uh, for me. So no matter historically how much we met later on or agreed or disagreed, we had many disagreements on human rights, even political disagreements, but still there was this sense of friendship and respect that stayed mm. all these years until the last day of his life, until he left uh, Ramallah on a helicopter. So. Uh, it's, it's important. It's important that you recognize, yes, there are leaders who are, you know, just, just incredibly uh, mind-boggling in, in their stature and their abilities and so on. And yet they are deep down, they are human beings. Mm -hmm. And they're human and they are people who should reach out to people and connect, connect with a sense of immediacy and honesty. Um, I, I mean, this is a conversation I think I want to have with you a bit more down, down the road, Doctora, uh, in our conversation about, you know, leadership, but also about the political systems, the house, the political house that you're able to participate in and help shape. And I feel like for a lot of young Palestinians, we feel like we've lost that. Yeah. Um, but before we get that, I really wanted to ask you about your journey back home after being gone for so long, what that must have been like after Paris. Uh, did you go through Amman? Yeah. Went to Beirut and from Beirut. And of course, I saw Abu Jihad in Beirut. And uh, to tell you frankly, I don't talk about these things a lot these days. It's never safe to tell mm. everything anyway. But Abu Jihad was always insistent that the Palestinian revolution is made up press. You have fighters, you have revolutionaries, but you have the most important thing is to build institutions, to build mm. society, to to... Um, get a sense of resilience and cohesiveness and ability to uh, withstand external, where the Palestinian people are, not just mm -hmm. in exile and outside. There were these two uh, tensions, you know, two currents, people who thought that the revolution is outside and where the leadership is, is where the focus is, and those who felt that, no, you had to build on the ground, you had to build where the people were, and Abu Jihad was very insistent, you have to go back, you have to teach, you have to build the universities, build institutions, build society. Uh, at one point, even later on, they wanted to support, they help us uh, get together a theater movement, for example, mm -hmm. support different types uh, of, of activities because they wanted to see a whole cohesive, healthy, complete society on the ground. So I worked in all these different areas. And um, uh, I told Abu Jihad, I will go home and I will work and it might take some time, but uh, um, I decided to cross the bridge. Mm. That wasn't easy at all, as you know, it, it was an ordeal crossing the bridge. Uh, at that time, much more difficult than it is now. You had to get body searched, you were questioned, you were isolated, you were threatened. Um, and anyway, finally I did, uh, get home and I started teaching at Wirzit and I was arrested. Mm. <laughs> uh, I think it was the f first or second time I was in a, in a demonstration. Now, Wirzit at that time was beginning to be a university and I was setting up the, the major, not the department itself because there was a department, the English major, 
mm. program and uh, so on. And at the same time, I was very close to my students. There were students who were older than I was. There were older students who had come back to the university to, to study, including writers like Sahar Khalifa or an older like Nihai al-Masri, and there were other uh, young men. Who, so they used to call me our little teacher because <laughs> I was a younger one. And uh, we established this relationship uh, with the students, of course. And uh, uh, not with the Sahara and others, but anyway, whenever there were any demonstrations, whenever there were any protests, we would join. Mm -hmm. Teachers and students. So I used to get arrested with my students. And we used to get detained and so on. And uh, uh, then I was arrested and tried for, they said, violating, for, for threatening the security of the State of Israel and for violating the terms of my family reunion. Uh, because they thought since I had a family, I wasn't supposed to engage in any activity. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I was tried and I was uh, sentenced, but then the uh, faculty members decided to pay my fine. Uh, of course, at that time, we were determined not to pay fines. We would go to prison rather than to pay. But the teacher said, you're being tried on behalf of all of us. So <laughs> they decided to pay my fine, and I came home. Uh, at one point, my mother, I remember, was saying, maybe it's safer for you in jail, because at least you won't get shot at or beaten up. <laughs> Imagine a mother worrying about her daughter's safety to the point where she thinks jail might be safer than facing the Israeli army. And anyway, that's another story. I feel like I've, I've always been curious about what One were... Thing I must tell you yeah, that's very please, important. Please, please. The setting up, we set up, when I first got there, the, the, um, um, the, the Legal Aid Committee. Mm. It was a committee, a group to defend students who were arrested or detained or being tried and so on. And because I was also at one point, I became the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and I was in charge of the old campus. Uh, so I was uh, constantly in, in, in charge of maintaining the safety of, of my students. But the Legal Aid Committee was very distinctive because it was made up of faculty members, staffers. And we uh, got in touch with lawyers. At that time, Palestinian lawyers were on strike, so we had two Israeli lawyers, three actually. The two who defended the, the students were Liat Seymel, of course, the mm -hmm. day and night to defend our students, and uh, Felicia Langer, uh, later on she left. And then we had others who volunteered to come and help uh, our students. But uh, that was a very important moment where you felt, uh, or, or stage, where students felt that we were all together, that they had a, a defense mechanism, that they had lawyers. They, they would meet in my house, uh, families with the lawyers in my house and so on. And uh, there was a closeness. You're talking about structures and institutions. Mm -hmm. we the legal aid committee. Nobody gave us any money. Nobody gave us any uh, support. We, we did it by ourselves because we knew that this is what was needed to help us. Mm -hmm. And our students felt that we had their back. Huh? So that was important. And other uh, institutions were, were set up. Also, you know, things like uh, the union. We set up the union of workers <laughs> and, and so on. Uh, and Perfect. then after yeah. For a lot of us, I think, for a lot of Palestinians who, who I mean, we were too young uh, and weren't even born during that time, I think we always romanticize, in a way, the life before the first intifada and the sense of community and, and uh, yes. solidarity and collectiveness amongst yes. people. Uh, it would be great That's to hear from you <laughs> what life was like, uh, um, I mean, in terms of what, what, what were the forms of repression that you faced, but also as a community, how did you deal with it? And, and as, yeah. as, as, you know, as 86, 87 approached, could you see where it was leading? Yeah, that's true. There, there were many, what we call many intifadas. The mm -hmm. Palestinians never acquiesced, of course, to, to the occupation. And the concept of sumud was very important. You had to maintain your resilience, your strength, your ability to be steadfast, 
to uh, not to allow Israel to kick you out and so on. And Israel used many different ways of, of uh, fighting us, uh, not just the army, because we were being, of course, uh, arrested, detained, interrogated. I was constantly being detained every occasion there was, you know, whether 5th of June or whether it's uh, Balfour Day or whether <laughs> they, they call this preemptive detention. Mm -hmm. And most of us went through that. Uh, and we also went on, on strikes and, and so on. But they also managed to use the um, uh, punitive measures of the British mandate, the colonial measures, because it's not just administrative detention. It was also house demolition, and it was also deportation and expulsion, mm -hmm. in addition to censorship, in addition to everything else. So... Um, uh, we went through a period where Israel systematically attempted to carry out what we call the political decapitation of the Palestinian people. Anytime political leadership came out, uh, they would deport them or imprison them. And so, uh, uh, and they tried to find alternative leadership like the village leagues and, and collaborators and so on, which of course, they didn't succeed in doing. And I always tell people, Palestinians under occupation lived for decades under the most horrific conditions and threats and fear and violence and, and punitive measures. And we didn't develop a culture of collaboration. We didn't develop a whole uh, a scene of collaborators working for Israel, ever. There was always this commitment to uh, serve to service, a commitment to resist, a, a commitment to the uh, people themselves. And that, that was very distinctive. That was extremely distinctive. And the definition of leadership, of course, was different. Leadership to us at that point meant the willingness to take risks, the willingness to sacrifice, the willingness to work in secret in the dark, uh, the willingness to be arrested or deported. Uh, it, it wasn't, there, there were no trimmings of power. There was no recognition. There was no money. There were not, there was nothing. It was the ability and the willingness to sacrifice, mm -hmm. to, to try your best. And that's why we romanticize that period because everybody was in that spirit, in that mood, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and of course, at that time, all social relations were different, the economic situation was different, we need hours to discuss that. The sense of leadership was different, the women's movement emerged as a powerful movement, the definition of uh, uh, honor and shame shifted within society, so there were so many changes as a result of self-help initiatives, uh, uh, mm. proactive initiatives by people who felt a sense of cohesion that we were all in this together. Nobody wanted to gain anything out of it. You all, we all wanted to serve uh, in it and, and, and to be part of the cause. And that's why every single group of leadership, whether it's Abhal Watani or others, was either detained or deported and so on. And that's why in, uh, when the uh, Intifada started, we could see that there was something simmering underneath. Huh? even though economically there were many workers working within Israel, but uh, in, in terms of basic freedoms and rights and so on, we were really, uh, I don't want to say under the boot, but we were held under very tight and restrictive controls. Hmm? And it was extremely dangerous because you never knew, you could be, you know, you could be killed uh, walking down the street or you could get, get out one morning and uh, there's a curfew or your, the, the military checkpoint is right in front of your house, or you, you could be detained. You never knew it was, it was the unpredictable what it was, you know. Do you but, have any stories about political organizing at that time? How, how do you navigate that environment of oppression? Yeah, well, we, we worked together not on the basis of uh, factional affiliation. Mm. That was very important to us. Yes, there were people who were Fatah, there were people who were uh, uh, within the Communist Party at that time, the People's Party, there were people who were PFLP and so on. But everybody was, uh, of course, it was secret. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, for example, I decided to work as an independent after I left my organization because I said this is one way I could transcend factionalism and I could serve the cause. And I worked 
mm-hmm. council when it was Fatah. I was the advisor to the student council when it was the, the uh, communist party and when it was a coalition of the left and so on, because I felt that uh, as a faculty member, you know, I, I wanted to be uh, supportive of the student movement and I didn't want it to be defined or fragmented by factionalism. So in many ways, uh, being organized within existing factions, the, the one thing that didn't exist at the time was, was Hamas, but later on came. Uh, but we worked with everybody and there was room. Birzeit was, in a sense, a microcosm of a real democracy in Palestine. Mm-hmm. But you had the freedom to belong to different organizations. You, you even created one, but we had an anarchist movement. Afif uh, al-Akhdar, I think it was, <laughs> set up an anarchist uh, organization. People felt free to organize, to have new ideas, to work together, to to belong to organizations or to be independent. So before the First Intifada, when we set up at the First Intifada, the political committee, there were many factional leaders in it, but there were also independents in it mm-hmm. because there was room to be independent because the, the uh, collective, the struggle was for everybody, not just for the factions. There was no monopoly. The, that's, a, that's something my generation doesn't recognize, right? Because we grew up under a very polarized and tribal faction um, structure, right? And for us, a lot of young people even don't belong to any of the political parties because they don't recognize the, the, the ability to engage. Exactly. Um, yeah. Because the parties we... became closed systems, the way the political yeah. system became closed, the way the uh, political hierarchy became closed, the way people started putting their own self-interest or factional interest above the national interest. And look, I mean, look at the leadership. How yeah. much has it changed? <laughs> mm-hmm. How much has it, yeah, how, how, mm-hmm. how have we evolved? How have we, in, in, in many ways, made room for the younger generations, for women and young men and so on? It, it's different because that was a period of flux, a period of formation. We didn't have set institutions. And the political parties or factions or organizations existed in order to serve the struggle. So even though they had factional rivalries, they all knew that they were within that, uh, uh, that whole focus. Mm-hmm. Uh, that but um, now I see factionalism becoming much more important. Now I see um, rigid systems, political yeah. systems and control. We were at that time much more, as I said, troublemakers. We were people who challenged the status quo. We were people who wanted to break through. We were people who wanted to shape the future. Uh, And we were defying the occupation directly. Uh, Mm. Unlike you people, you're you're defying the occupation indirectly. You have to go to the occupation to face Mm. it. You have to go to the checkpoint. You have to... We saw it everywhere. <laughs> You'd open the door and there's, I opened the door, my house, and there was the military governor across mm-hmm. the street. So, and, there were, and, and my house was being raided regularly by the Israeli army and I had to fight to prevent them from coming in. And we had to hide all sorts of documents and things. We'll talk about this another time. Hey, it's me again. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe below. Thank you. People felt that this is a period of change. This is a transformational period because spontaneously, without even sitting back and thinking and organizing, and some people said, we've had enough. We've had enough. And they came out (laughs) in, in hundreds and thousands, really. And then it became a way of life. Mm that you never accepted what they forced on you, that this was the challenge. This was a battle of wills. Who runs our lives? We wanted to be free. We wanted to run our lives. And we wanted to defy the occupation in every manifestation, in every possible way. So we started going out. Look, when we demonstrated, we had men and women and children and everybody coming out. And we were facing you know, really fully armed soldiers and we were facing very intensive tear gas and we were beaten. I was beaten up repeatedly. I, <laughs> and I used to come home, you know, unable to see because of this very concentrated tear gas and so on. I think part of my allergies is a result of that. 
And uh, uh, my daughters would be terrified when they saw me coming home. They were little kids. Uh, and I couldn't take them out at all. We couldn't do normal things. We, we couldn't go shopping. You couldn't take, there were no movies. You couldn't do any normal activities with kids. So we had to shelter them at home. But we went out and, uh, and, and we demonstrated regularly. Mm-hmm. It was to us, uh, it was a challenge. Eventually, the Intifada led to Madrid, the Madrid yeah. process, yeah. and then to Oslo. And that, for, for us, it's an extremely divisive period. Um, how did you feel about it? How did you engage with it then? And, and obviously, look back at it now, what are your thoughts? In going to Madrid, we saw this as a turning point. This is the historical turning point. This is where we built on the revolution, we built on the intifada, we built on the persistence and resilience of the Palestinian people, on the PLO and its collective history of struggle. And we were telling the world, this is who we are. We want to be free. Doctor, one thing, one thing we, I think would be great to get your, your take on is, for, for a lot of us, we look at the, the, the history of the national movement, the Palestinian national struggle. And there was a pivot away from a one democratic secular state in historic mm-hmm. Palestine to one yeah. is a state with a solution. Yeah. solution. And I think yeah. that's also a part of the conversation of unpacking Madrid and, and Oslo and, and why you, the leadership, why at that moment in Palestinian national history, you, they felt that it was, it was needed to, to move forward there. No, no, we had the, the one state solution the one democratic national state, uh, uh, non-sectarian or secular state, was uh, uh, presented in 1968-69. Mm. It was a PLO position. And we, at that time, I remember, I mean, the, the writing of the, the concept of the one democratic non-sectarian as a way of de-Zionizing the Zionist movement in a sense that Palestine has to be uh, uh, an inclusive a diverse, pluralistic country that uh, uh, has room for everybody, and that religion does not define you mm-hmm. in any ways. Because we, we felt there were people who were uh, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and, Pal- and non believers, I don't know, in Palestine, but still, that Palestine should not be defined in, a monol- defined in a monolithic way. And we saw the Zionist movement at that time as a very destructive, exclusivist. Uh, movement and I still think of it as an exclusivist destructive movement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we we gave the world a way out, and immediately we were turned down. Immediately we were shut down. The people were saying, "What you are? You're trying to destroy Zionism. You're trying to destroy Israel. You're trying uh, what you couldn't do through armed struggle and so on. You're trying to do <laughs> through a political uh, uh, movement." And we didn't have any takers. Mm-hmm. We didn't have any partners, and Israel fought it, you know, tooth and nail to to stop it. And it didn't last long as a movement, to be frank. Madrid was one thing, and Washington, and of course the Oslo agreements were another. I don't want to get into all the details, but we certainly had no intention of moving in the direction of the uh, Declaration of Principles. Which was the Oslo approach, just to highlight the people. The Oslo approach was quite different. I mean, that was, these were secret talks between a couple Mm -hmm. of Palestinians and so on. Our approach was quite different. Our approach was based exactly on the opposite. In Madrid and in Washington, we were dealing with the real issues, the core issues. When you start with Jerusalem borders, of course, based on the right to self-determination and human rights and, and the need for sovereignty. And, mm-hmm. and we said our objective is the devolution of occupation, evolution of statehood. And the occupation of a Palestinian state. This was our approach. The approach in, in the DOP, uh, it's an Oslo process or whatever, it was quite different. And it was exactly the opposite. They started with the technical issues, side issues, peripheral issues and everything else they said can be postponed without even guarantees, without, without anything. The, to me, the this most was- The critical issues, as you said, refugees. Um, the real Jerusalem. issues were there, the, the refugees, the borders, Jerusalem, yeah. The settlements, 
we wanted to begin dismantling settlements, not just, we refused to say cessation of settlement activities or even freeze of settlement activities. We said ending settlement activities and beginning dismantling, the dismantlement of settlements. We wanted to end that whole process of colonialism, that whole process of encroachment, of building this reality. And frankly speaking, uh, I always quote Elan Pape, but he was right. This is what the Zionist movement wanted. Displace and replace the whole nation. Mm -hmm. So we wanted but to- But if you don't mind me, if you don't mind me asking, then why, why do you think Oslo was signed? If, I mean, there were two different processes. One was in Madrid, one was in Oslo, but Oslo was signed. And the legacy of Oslo, which I think we'll get into now, is, is one of, of, you know, historic, Catastrophe, in a sense, um, in many it's, ways. It's mixed, yes. It's, it's very difficult. It's a tremendous letdown. No, we, we had told the leadership then, and I remember even meetings with Nelson Mandela when in Tunis he came to see us when we went to see Arafat. We were saying you should be ready. It's going to take some time, and it's a major battle, but we know the Israelis. We, because we were, you know, being sent by the PLO, we know what it takes and we are steadfast mm -hmm. and we will not be intimidated. Huh? And uh, we said, you have to have tulet roh, you have to be patient, you have to know mm -hmm. that this is a battle that cannot be resolved instantly. And the Israelis are used to this, this and they use their power against us and we refuse. It's a whole paradigm, a whole uh, system of relationships. Mm -hmm. But and we said, if we solve the real issues, the core issues, then everything else would fall in place. In the 1980s, there was a military governor called Menachem Wilson, I remember. And of course, he had an advisor called uh, Egal Alon. Egal, no, Egal Carmon. Egal Carmon, who was Shamir's advisor on anti-terrorism and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they sent after us and they um, offered us to run our lives under the military occupation. They told us you can take care of your, take charge of the health system, take charge of your school system, take charge of your municipalities, take charge of everything. Huh? And we will not interfere in these things. Mm -hmm. And we said, you must be crazy. <laughs> we want to be free. We said, why don't you withdraw? Huh? And we are perfectly capable of running everything in our lives, of building our own institutions. I mean, this was the essence of Antifada, that mm -hmm. we have the will. This is our own voice. We said, we don't want to be uh, employees of the, the occupation. We are not administrators under the occupation. Mm -hmm. We can run our lives very easily. We are educated. We are uh, well equipped to do that. Our problem is not that. Our problem is the occupation. So I don't think you will find a single Palestinian collaborator who will take his or her job from you mm -hmm. to make the occupation functionable <laughs> or yeah. easier for you. So, so this was in 1980. It's huh? eerily the reality today, isn't it, in a way? <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, this is always what the Israelis wanted. Yeah. We knew it. Unfortunately, the people who negotiated did not live under occupation. They didn't know the Israelis very well. They didn't understand what this meant. But mm -hmm. you cannot adopt these, these functional, uh, take over this functional responsibilities and separate the people from the land and, and take over... Uh, uh, a phased approach where the interim would become. We said the Israelis will give you maybe one inch and then they will make it a centimeter, then they will make it a millimeter, then they will renege on it. No, you have to insist on the real things. Mm. Uh, and then the core issues, then everything else will fall in place. And we, don't, we can set up our own systems without the Israelis, mm. but they, they saw in this, there were two things. First of all, I think they wanted to save the PLO and bring the leadership back. Mm -hmm. This is the one way I'm sure, I know that's what Abu Ammar told me, that they sold it to the leadership, that you are going home, you're going back. 
don't underestimate the, the it's powerful. Yeah, it's a powerful argument. You're going home. People yeah. who never thought they would come home. And you're going home to live with your own people. Huh? Mm -hmm. That to, to Obama, that was amazing. He said, I'm, I'm on my way back to Jerusalem. So when we suggested that since they signed this as an interim phase, why don't you assign people to run the interim phase, keep the PLO out so that it won't live under occupation and appoint people, your mm -hmm. own people to run, but don't bring the PLO under occupation because it's greater than that. Huh? Let that, the PLO negotiate freely. Mm -hmm. Doctor, I think you there just, I think for at least the way I, the, the, when I read history, that's, that was the critical element when the PLO came under occupation, when there was that power relationship and leverage, the whole dynamic of our national movement changed. It shifted. It shifted. You yes. Know? It changed and we ended up setting up systems without control, trying to deliver services with Israeli sovereign control, um, enabling Israel to um, exploit time and space to create facts mm -hmm. without getting any guarantees of any intervention, of any accountability. We said we needed accountability, we needed arbitration. We ne At least if you sign this agreement, I remember when I first saw it, I was really shocked. Can we get any kind of assurances and guarantees can we get any kind remember uh, we didn't go to madrid and without getting a letter of assurances from the americans which mm -hmm. of course they reneged on anyway but at least they talked about the settlements being illegal about not annexing jerusalem about all these things which we worked on <laughs> with them but these guys signed an agreement without arbitration with, uh, mechanisms without assurances and guarantees uh, without oversight uh, monitoring, mm -hmm. verification, without any kind of international presence, international real uh, role in order to prevent Israel from exploiting its power. This was our major problem. As I'm, I'm 30 years old, so I, all the entire reality I've known is the Oslo era, the Oslo paradigm. You know, we are the generation that grew up thinking... Don't, don't that, define yourself that way, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, you deserve uh, better, yeah. Yeah, but, but now we, we seem to be in a, living in a one-state reality where Israel still controls everything from the river to the sea. As you said, you know, we're, we're, we have a, an authority that's a service delivery mechanism. And for, for young Palestinian, uh, you know, we, I crave, we crave a political system that used to be the PLO that you talked about that brought together not just the Palestinians of the West Bank, but also the Palestinian, all 13 million of us all around the world. Exactly, that's the PLO. That's the PLO. So, but the PLO is no longer what it was. And, it's been, and so yes. The question is, how can we reinvigorate the PLO, reform it to make it democratic? You have to. You, you can't do it unless you take it over. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do it with the existing mechanisms, with the existing people. We've been talking about reforming the PLO for years. We know that the purpose of any agreement was really to eradicate the PLO as a political organization representative mm -hmm. body. We wanted to save it in order to reinvigorate it, to strengthen it, and to give it the legitimacy and the recognition it deserved and the Palestinian people needed. So we're not going to throw out the PLO, but what we're going to do is reinvent it. <laughs> what we have to do is reform it. I think the young should join the PLO. That's why I keep encouraging young people Mm -hmm. uh, you should redefine it, you should institutionally change it, you should uh, challenge it, you should demand of it and of yourselves. But the thing is, I know the PLO can be a closed system in many ways. People have vested interests in others. Mm -hmm. There is a polarization here where you have, you know, the PLO led by Fatah and you have Hamas and others trying to establish another power system. And they all have vested interests and control and in, in power and mm -hmm. privilege and benefit and so on. So what you need to do is you need to intrude, you need to intervene, you need to be troublemakers, you need to challenge both. And you, you need to say no, that the future demands new mechanisms, new ways of thinking, new organizational principles. Uh, if you go and say, let's go back to 68, 69 and one state uh, solution and so on. The problem is not just that. The problem is that Israel 
is really systematically attempting to eradicate Palestine. Everything in Palestine, the history, the culture, the identity, the presence, the rights, and they are now creating a narrative that is totally exclusive of any Palestinian presence. Mm -hmm. Don't think that Palestinians want to live under occupation or accept it until a one-state solution evolves. That, that might be too simple and too complex at the same time, too difficult. Because there are many Palestinians like me. I want to be a Palestinian. I want to see myself live freely on my own land with my own children and grandchildren. I don't want Israel to continue to wield power. I want to see my land saved. I don't want to see them expanding constantly. I don't want to see that narrative that they have adopted. That this, and, and actually, the, this has become part of the, the, the global narrative. Who are the Palestinians? I think we're back not just to square one, we're back to minus, where the Israelis have superimposed a very false narrative that they've always been here. This has always been their land. They have all, mm. and the Palestinians who are the intruders. Now we, the indigenous people, are being called intruders. <laughs> and Israel, that had nothing to do with Palestine for thousands of years. I mean, you want to reorganize your world the way it was a few thousand years ago, good luck. But you mm. cannot be in Palestine. <laughs> and we are the people of the land who have been living here continuously. I don't want to be an Israeli. I, I, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear, Doctor. I think that the, the debate for a lot of us now within society is looking back at the last 30 years. That it, it was a political project. It was a very specific political project. And it didn't yield the results that it intended, you know. Well, in, in, you know, regardless of the way that came to fruition, whether it was through Washington or through Oslo. But here we are now in a one-state reality. Um, no, it's not a one-state reality. I'm so sorry. It's not a one-state reality. It is still a displacement replacement paradigm. Mm -hmm. They don't want a one state. What they're creating, it's not even apartheid. It's not one state. It's a series of isolated Bantustans under total military control, and Israel has full sovereign powers, and you have no powers. Mm -hmm. So, what you're seeing is the disappearance of Palestine. What you're seeing is the subsuming of Palestine by Israel. What you're seeing is the creation of a very deliberate system of injustice, of oppression. Huh? So, you know how my, I mean, I've been friends with the ANC for many years, and we have many South African friends. And okay, they said this is not apartheid. This is much worse than apartheid. Mm -hmm. And I was in South Africa a couple of years ago. What Israel is doing to the Palestinian is the process of eradication. It's very serious. Absolutely. It's State reality. It's a eradication of your state. It's a eradication of your history. It's a displacement replacement paradigm where they tell you you have no right to your narrative, your history, your culture, your rights, your humanity, your future, not just your political program. So you don't oversimplify it. It's not a one state reality mm -hmm. and it's not an apartheid state. It is a colonial occupation. It is a displacement replacement paradigm, but it's not just an occupation, a colonial occupation. Doctor, I, I, I hear you. I, I guess the question was, we are confronted with this paradigm um, yes. and our political project to pursue our self-determination within this paradigm over the last 30 years hasn't lead, has, did not lead to success. The first step, as you said, is we need to rebuild our political system, our political institutions. Where, but where, where are we going next? What, what comes next? Where do we move forward? I've read many, look, um, to me, the people themselves to stay on their own land. This is very important. I mean, I may disagree with the whole system set up by, by the, the Oslo process or whatever, but you need to empower the Palestinian people. You cannot constantly allow the weakening, the disempowerment of the Palestinians and say then we will become a one state and it will be a Palestinian state in the future and blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. Because Israel is not an even, it's not a neutral bystander. Israel is actively engaged 
in undermining every aspect of your life. Don't underestimate the, the Greater Zionist Project. They are going to take over all of historical Palestine, and that's what they're doing. And they're negating whatever you are. It's not a demographic issue anymore. And I refuse to be seen as a demographic threat to Israel. So what you need to do is to start a political movement to empower the Palestinian people. What you need to do is make sure that the people are on the land, the people of the land are on the land, to present the Palestinian narrative and humanity and reality to the rest of the world. Gain solidarity and support. We have a network of support now. The world is beginning to know the Palestinian narrative is now being understood, is being heard. Uh, you're no longer, you don't exist, or you're a Pakistani, or you're a terrorist, or you're you know, a refugee. Now you are, you know, you have, another, you have a fullness, and you have there's a, parallel, there's a parallel, Doctor, to what you were talking about within the students' movement and being part of a, a, a bigger global movement. I think for us, exactly. we feel that in a way as well, the idea of being inter, uh, intersectionality of different solidarity movements, whether Absolutely. it's white, people of color. But the question we've always, we always get asked is, okay, where are you going? What is next? What do you want We next? want to be free. Freedom, dignity, rights, self-determination. We, we have the right to all these things. I do not take out just rights and say, I want this to be equal rights. No, I don't want to have equal rights under Israel. I don't want to be an Israeli. I don't want them to be an occupying power. Delegitimize the occupation itself. Relegitimize your narrative, your history, your rights. That's what we need to do. <laughs> I mean, your narrative should say, first of all, you have to affirm who you are and never succumb to all these attempts to, to negate and deny and create a spurious and, and, and the false narrative about you. This is very important. And as you said, yes, intersectionality, it's everywhere. The women, the youth, the, the minorities, the people of color, these are all our natural allies. And Israel cannot look any system that is based on oppression of the victim and on the ignorance of others will not last because ignorance is a transient reality. People learn, mm. ultimately. And it's our job to make people learn and to gain mm. friends and people in solidarity with us and people who will challenge it. You don't know the price that people paid by standing up with us, by standing up to Israel. The people who lost their jobs, their careers, their standing, their everything, it's not new. But now it's much safer. Mm. Before, if you said you were pro-Palestinian, you're a terrorist. You lost everything. And there were people who were willing to do that till we got to this point. We didn't get to it, you know, suddenly. It's the continu continuity of Palestinian struggle. It's the persistence of the Palestinian people. It's our refusal to be silenced or intimidated or even suppressed. It's our mm -hmm. refusal to deal with their, not just narrative, to deal with their terms of reference on their terrain. Take the struggle to your terrain, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your rights. Take the initiative, challenge, define. This isn't, it's not going to last forever. It's going to take time. But right now you have to decide what your priorities are. And you have to decide it not by finding easy, convenient things, no. And not by borrowing the language of the older generation, your language. Make it creative, make it seething, make it... Uh, uh, <laughs> proactive challenge. Mm. Uh, as I said, be troublemakers always. Troublemakers. And, and define, define the path ahead. You don't have to get there, you know, overnight. Help the Palestinian people's resilience. Now, today, under uh, uh, lockdown, it hurts me when people start criticizing the political system and people and so on. I say, well, these are the people now who are standing out there at checkpoints, who are taking risks for our own We would have had to do it underground if we didn't have the system. Huh? Mm. We used to do these things, but we didn't have the means and so on. Now these people are trying to maintain your ability to stay. They're trying mm -hmm. to maintain the fact that you have enough food or the fact that we will try against tremendous odds and the occupation and all the oppression to make sure you have a minimal uh, health service system that functions. 
we're trying to make sure that we, we prevent the spread, the wild and uncontrolled spread of the coronavirus by having the, the security system, health service system, and so on. And all the institutions work. So now mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit back and say, you're this and you're that. I'm going to say, thank you. You're taking risks. You are serving your people. You're trying to serve, save the people regardless of everything else. Yeah. Then we can talk about now. I think, this are, is I think there we can agree, Doctor. I think the, the, yeah. what, what, the, what they've done in terms of prevention and not allowing a mass outbreak to happen needs to be commended. But I think it's a, it's a more complex subject for another day that you and I can Exactly. Talk. This is right now. This is not the time to, you know, so sort of tell them, why don't you go home or dissolve the PA or whatever. Yeah. I, want to, I want to ask you one last question. Um, okay. To end here. You've had uh, uh, an amazing, illustrious career and still are. Uh, an amazing life of, full of uh, rich experiences and lessons. I wanted to ask you, um, what is the thing you are proudest of the most? Um, <laughs> it's very difficult because every phase I've done something I'm proud of and I've done something. I don't know. I mean, I'm happy with, I, I like my activist work. I like my academic work. I liked my legislative work when I ran for elections and I won. It was really invigorating because every post I've had, I've won through elections, whether in the PLC and I ran for both elections or even in the PLO. Uh, I think more than anything else, in, in terms of my own personal satisfaction in the public domain, in the political sphere, I think it's the first intifada. Mm. Because I felt that this was matters coming to a head as a result of our incremental work and the spirit and the achievements and the, the, the sense of collective responsibility and sacrifice and willingness this was very unusual. This was a period in our history that should be documented, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I set up a, a whole school system for our neighborhood within a weekend. We, we understood, they closed down our schools and we set up an alternative school system and the army used to come down here and they used to try to... My daughter Zena was six years old. When Abu Jihad was killed, this, the first grade went out carrying black flags. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And the army was running after first grade students. I mean, but we had a school system that told the Israelis, you may close down our schools, but we will build our own educational system regardless. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, anyway, there were all sorts of things associated with Antifada, which brings to mind the, the human spirit that refuses to be defeated. Mm -hmm. and the spirit of solidarity and commonality. And, and we, could, really, we could really use that spirit uh, these days. I want to thank you so much for this. It's been enriching. And as always, I learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you for your time. Just talking to you. Yeah, we look to you for the future, yeah. Salem. Don't believe that take people... A whole generation, Doctor. That's going to take a whole generation. Um, yeah, it'll take a generation or two, but we'll get there. I'm confident. Yeah. Inshallah. Thank you so much and please stay healthy and safe. My pleasure. You too. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye bye. If you know any Palestinians that you think we should feature under the ship, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Our contact information is in the description below. So please reach out. Hope you enjoyed the episode.